If you missed any of the other videos in this series, you can find links to them in the description box. Now, as I've explained in previous videos, the only proper function of government is the protection of inalienable rights, and any time government goes beyond that point, it will be initiating force against the people it was created to protect, which will result in a violation of rights. This must not be permitted, and the point of constitution is to specify this limitation. More on the constitution another time. So because government must not do anything beyond protect and retaliate against the initiation of force, this means that most of what the United States government does today, perhaps as much as 90% of it, must be eliminated. And correspondingly, nearly all of the real estate that it now controls must be given up. I find this subject fascinating because it requires thinking outside of the box. Let's start by looking at the local level and working our way up. In fact, I'll start with the non-government controls that I have right here in my own neighborhood. I touched on this in an earlier video. There are only two ways you can get a man to behave the way you want. You either force him, which you mustn't do, or you persuade him to agree. In my neighborhood, I have a homeowners association, an HOA. The HOA is primarily concerned with maintaining property values. That is, if I keep my house in tip-top shape, but the neighbors let theirs run down, it will have a detrimental effect on my happiness and self-esteem, and on the value of my property when I sell. I will not be able to get the price I had hoped for, because buyers will be discouraged by the appearance of surrounding properties. So the purpose of the HOA is to enforce covenants, conditions, and restrictions, or CCNRs. These are simply rules that we each accept upon purchase or rental of the property to do or refrain from doing certain things. These rules say such things as we agree to pay the monthly dues, keep our houses in good repair and freshly painted using agreed-upon colors, keep the landscape well tended, not let our cars drip oil on the driveways, make exterior architectural changes only after approval by our review board, and so on. If one of us disregards a rule, the HOA board first gently reminds us of what we agreed to. Then, if the homeowner does not take corrective action after several polite reminders, the HOA calls on a lawyer who charges the homeowner with breach of agreement. The ultimate action is to forcibly evict the homeowner from the neighborhood. These CCNRs are said to run with the land or transfer with the property, meaning that when I sell my house, the next owner accepts the CCNRs at the moment of purchase. The CCNRs can be altered, but only by a vote of the members. Now it is important to note that my HOA owns several common areas, such as this one, which includes a basketball court, tennis courts, and plenty of shady lawn. I, being a member in good standing of my HOA, jointly own this property. I own a share of it, which I purchased when I bought my house, and will sell when I sell my house. My HOA does not own the roads. We have often considered taking ownership of the roads and installing a gate and having our own guard whose job will be to watch for burglars and other intruders. If an intruder is found, the job of the guard is to keep him pinned down or at least within sight until an agent of the government, a policeman with a gun and a pair of handcuffs, can be called in to physically capture the perpetrator. So, as it happens, my HOA does not own the roads and sidewalks, street lamps and so on. Instead, we rely on the HOA at the next higher level. In my case, this is a municipality known as the city. My municipality is easily recognizable by this building here. I am essentially a member of this higher HOA as I live within its jurisdiction, as well as within my smaller neighborhood jurisdiction, and I pay fees to both. Now what does this municipality do? It's complicated. It is a strange tangle of HOA and government, and as I see it, these two should be untangled. The municipality should operate just like my neighborhood HOA, in that it should maintain the roads, contract with utilities such as electricity, water, and gas, which it currently does, but it should not be involved with the law any more than my neighborhood of HOA is. It should not have the power of compulsion. It should instead recognize me as a joint owner of the roads, parks, lakes, and rivers, and so on, and treat me as such. Instead of the municipality imposing taxes upon me and the local businesses, I should be able to contribute by designating a portion of my monthly neighborhood HOA dues to be sent up the chain. Instead of the municipality forcing residents to comply with its codes, statutes, and ordinances via a police force, it should be done by a guard service, first reminding residents to abide by their local and municipal level CCNRs that they accepted upon purchase or rental of their property, then, and only upon continued violation of the agreement, call in the government. 
A thousand questions arise at this point, and I'll do my best to anticipate as many as I can. What about visitors? Those who don't own or rent property within the jurisdiction, but are just traveling through. How should a municipality impose the CCNRs upon them? By the concept of trespass. Anyone who enters the city and disobeys a rule can be treated as an unwelcome guest, a trespasser, and escorted out, or if violent, incarcerated, just as anyone else would be. The trespasser violates the rights of a property owner because he forces the owner to tolerate his presence and activities against the owner's will. What about victimless crimes, typically known as vice? A victimless crime is an action that violates the rights of no one. It is the result of a law that punishes a man for committing no injustice. An individual convicted of a victimless crime is himself the victim of an injustice. Vice is a very rubbery term because it can be stretched to cover any activity of which the majority disapprove. This can vary greatly from one neighborhood to another, but it usually includes the ownership, trading, and consumption of alcohol, tobacco, firearms, recreational drugs, the participation in gambling, betting, prostitution, and so on. The activities the residents choose to exclude can be merged into their CCNRs and enforced in the same manner as all the other CCNRs. In short, an owner or renter who disregards a rule can be charged with breach of agreement, and a visitor from outside can be charged with trespass. As all property, meaning roads, sidewalks, parks, and so on, would be recognized as jointly owned by all individual property owners, a similar set of CCNRs would apply to each plot of land. So if what I have so far explained were put into action, what changes would we observe? Very few, I think. Police departments would be recognized as private guard services, and most other city officials would be HOA volunteers instead of government employees. So it's likely that all anyone would see is a different logo on the reports and paychecks and I probably wouldn't come across any of those at all. But gradually, over the decades and centuries ahead, we would see the CCNRs evolve by vote. Some neighborhoods would relax their rules, and others would tighten them. This would be done because the owners found that their lifestyle and property values could be improved by changing their rules one way or the other, and other neighborhoods, observing the results, would learn from the experience and decide to follow suit, or not. We could expect to see some areas with very loose rules where almost any behavior was acceptable, where one could indulge one's fantasies and whims as one pleased, and presumably suffer the consequences of overindulgence, and other areas where the more straight-laced would prohibit such behavior. Over time, individuals would move to the areas where they found the prices and the rules most to their liking. We would then have achieved the greatest freedom possible. Now, the process I have explained so far can be termed privatization. That is, the improper functions of government, meaning nearly all of the alphabet agencies, are stripped of their coercive powers and report instead to an HOA structure, and the improper laws and other regulations are reclassified as CCNRs. If it doesn't protect anyone's rights, it is removed from government. All of this can be done at the stroke of a pen. The private ownership of all property, except that specifically required for government functions, meaning court buildings, military bases, and so on, would be accomplished by recognizing it as jointly owned by residents of the appropriate jurisdiction. By that, I mean local roads and parks would be owned jointly by the surrounding property owners. Highways, lakes, rivers, and state parks would be owned jointly by all the groups within the state. National parks, large recreation areas, and wildlands would be owned jointly by all property owners within the entire country. As you might remember from the song, This land is your land, this land is my land, We've been paying for the maintenance of the land all along, and we really are the owners, but you'd never know it from the way we are treated by our own government. The regions of owners could be adjusted as needed by vote. It may be agreeable to transfer ownership up or down the structure, or sell some lands to private owners for profit-making enterprises, such as toll roads and amusement parks, or to purchase them from private owners. Even the land needed for the proper government functions could be jointly owned by ourselves and made available to government at minimal charge or no charge. As I'm sure you have guessed by now, the same process of removing or privatizing the improper functions and improper laws of government can be performed in the same manner at the county, state, and national levels. In fact, some levels could be eliminated or new ones created as needed. 
Funding would be from the bottom up, that is, a portion of the fees I pay to my neighborhood HOA, as per my agreement upon renting or purchasing my house and land, would be passed up the chain. Likewise, CCNRs that were agreeable to multiple local HOAs could be pushed up the chain and applied to the larger jurisdiction. The most stable and common rules, such as which side of the road we agree to drive on, are already at the top and could stay there. The more controversial rules, particularly those pertaining to what we currently refer to as vice, would be pushed all the way down to the neighbourhood level, where they could be fine-tuned as frequently as needed. If you are wondering if having all these levels and rules would bankrupt the country, keep in mind that they already exist in the form of government, for which we are taxed. Government would be reduced to perhaps only 10% of its current size, and the size of the HOA structure would be controlled by funding which would be under our control as we could vote at our local level how much and for what functions we were willing to contribute. For example, if a community decides that it no longer wishes to participate in welfare, Medicare, Social Security and similar assistance programs, they would simply opt out. No level of the HOA structure would have the authority to compel anyone to participate other than through reach of agreement and government compulsion will be strictly limited to defence and retaliation. The size of the remaining government would also be controlled by how much we would be willing to contribute because, of course, taxation would be outlawed and funding of government provided by the various levels of HOAs all subject to our vote. You might be wondering at this point if everyone would immediately vote to cease funding the government and let it disintegrate. It could happen! But I strongly doubt it, because we only have to look at countries who wouldn't or couldn't defend themselves and have since been absorbed, enslaved or annihilated by aggressive enemies. Historians are fond of reminding us. A strictly limited government would constantly demonstrate to us that it had cut expenses to the minimum and any indications of inadequate funding would be widely publicised. What about safety? Much of what the city, county, state and national levels of the currently horrendously expensive bureaucratic tangle do is to force us to behave in ways that are intended to reduce accidents. We are hemmed in, prevented in a thousand ways from doing anything where we could hurt ourselves. Is this a proper function of government? If so, it would mean that there would have to be such a thing as a right to be protected from accidents, which means that it is someone else's duty to protect us from accidents caused by ourselves and by others. As I've previously pointed out in these videos, there is no such thing as a right to something to be provided by others. It is not a proper function of government to attempt to keep us safe from accidents. It is only a proper function of government to protect us from the coercive acts of others. And as we can see, to make someone behave in a manner which you judge to reduce the risk of accident means coercing him to act against his judgment which is a violation of his rights. So this means that all government-funded safety and inspection programs and so on must be privatized, that is, funded instead by the HOA structure. And once that is done, we could vote with our communities to eliminate as much of it as we judged reasonable, save ourselves the expense, and instead take responsibility for our own action. What about all those rules that dictate how many handicapped parking spaces a parking lot must have? Wheelchair ramps, public restrooms, water fountains, and so on. The same would apply. Some neighbourhoods would vote to eliminate them, and others, perhaps, would be willing to spend more money and purchase and maintain more of them. Needless to say, a proper government does not have the authority to coin money or create fiat money and require its use, so a decision would have to be made about whether to privatise the legal tender laws or abolish them. You know me. I'd vote to abolish them immediately. This does raise the issue of whether it is appropriate to simply convert the improper laws and regulations to CCNRs regardless of who accepts them, or wait for neighbouring property owners to debate among themselves until they arrive at a single set. Given the volumes of legislation that currently exists, such a process could take centuries. On the one hand, you could argue that it would be most expedient to convert them all in one fell swoop, then let people sort out the mix later, on the grounds that it would be no worse than what we've tolerated all of our lives. And on the other hand, you could argue that once we actually recognize inalienable rights, we find that no one has the authority to enact such a sweeping change. It should be interesting. What I hope you got from this video is that it is possible to transition to a free society, and in my view, an understanding of inalienable rights and the proper function of government is greatly enhanced by visualizing such a transition. 
The transition I'm advocating here is only one of many possibilities. It's the one I judge most viable.